This video is supported by Galder's Gazetteer, a 5e expansion for advanced players. Alright everyone, quick video this week. I didn't write out a script, I just have some note cards. We can improvise most of this thing, try to get it done in one take. We'll see how that works out. This video is about 5th edition's missing weapons and armor. Arms and armaments that could and should be in the game, but aren't. By should, I mean these are pieces of equipment that are present in our popular imagination of fantasy. They're in literature and in video games. It would naturally fit in the big kitchen sink fantasy that is the Dungeons and Dragons brand. Or they are present in history in our quasi medieval pre-gunpowder era. And in the history of the D&D game itself, there are definitely weapons that were in previous editions but are absent from 5e. Shout out to you, Spike Chain. And by could be, I mean, if we look at the weapons and armor table, we can definitely see that there is a pattern. There's a certain logic that those things follow. And if we reverse engineer the rules that the designers used, we can find out which pieces are missing. We can fill in the gaps of the weapons and armor that could exist in this framework. And I promise I'm only going to include three new obscure pole arms. When I do these sorts of videos, when I delve into the mechanics of fifth edition, I usually find it helpful to go back through the D&D Next playtest to really figure out how we got to where we are. And with some exceptions, the weapons table actually changed very little. You could probably drop in the weapons as they're written the second playtest packet into your game and few'd be the wiser. Which brings up an interesting point. If they did so many playtest packets where lots of things in the system changed, why would they leave in weapons that are clearly unbalanced? Even a complete novice can recognize that a mace is simply an inferior version of a light axe. A scimitar is just a short sword that costs more. And the reason is the weapons, like most of 5th edition, are designed with fiction first. The reason they have both a mace and a morning star, even though historically they're the same weapons, is because they want clerics to have martial proficiency to be able to wield a blunted weapon without feeling like they're inferior. Because that fulfills our popular conception of what a cleric does. They didn't want to create a situation where the fighters felt compelled to walk around with spiked chains instead of swords and axes. Oddly, there is not a section on reflavoring weapons in the general equipment rules. They put that bit in the monk rules, which is different from how they initially put it, and that's probably a topic for another video. But because there's not an explicit provision for reflavoring weapons, I think this is an excellent excuse to go ahead and add some more. And the reason I haven't done this before is because when I asked what you wanted in Galders, you chose more combat options. There are of course some easy ways to plug in the gaps. The easiest of all is just to switch damage types. Taking a halberd and making it a blunt weapon. Wikipedia says the thing I'm thinking is called a bec de corbeau. Basically a warhammer on a long stick, or a mace that deals slashing damage as a machete. There are lots of examples, I'm sure. Another easy way is to do a dice swap. Anytime that there is a d8, you can replace it with 2d4 and give the weapon a new name. Your longsword becomes a falchion, your rapier becomes a saber. Yes, I know, technically it's going to deal 0.5 more damage on a hit and it's going to unbalance everything, but really I think that's kind of imperceptible. I think that small damage spike is going to get lost in the larger randomness of the d20 and who's attacking whom. Be sure to let me know why I'm wrong in the comments below. So that's the easy way. The fun way is to make new weapons that still follow the logic of the system. There are rules. And some of these rules are obvious, like a weapon cannot be both heavy and light. But some of them are not so obvious, and that's what I'm going to go ahead and dive into. Just a quick note, almost all the weapons can be constructed following this format, but there are some exceptions, and we'll go over those at the end of the video. Rule number one is weapons start as a d6 for the damage die, and properties change it. Let's go ahead and read this off, so I don't have a teleprompter for setup. When you give a weapon the martial, two-handed, heavy, or loading property, it causes the damage die to go up in size. Conversely, giving a weapon the reach, light, range, or finesse property causes the damage die to go down in size. So that connection between damage die and properties is rule number one. Rule number two is a weapon can be light or versatile or two-handed. Weapons that are light get the finesse property for free, and weapons that are two-handed, it unlocks the heavy property for that weapon. In other words, you cannot have a heavy property on a weapon unless it is already two-handed. Rule number three is weapons have a max damage die of D6 if they are light or if they can do damage at range with one hand. Spears, javelins, slings, they all fall into that category. And the last rule is weapons that have the heavy property cannot have finesse or thrown. So using those rules, we can build our own weapons, as long as what we create isn't strictly better than anything that's already in the table. Which is why we can't have a martial spear. A D8, D10 versatile weapon with a thrown property? <laughs> that's a long sword you can throw. So let's go ahead and use our imagination. What is a weapon that is two-handed, has reach, and the martial property? Well, how about a dire flail? That is a fun weapon from earlier in the game's history, sort of this long staff with balls and chains at the end. Weapon star is a D6 has the two-handed property, so it goes up to a D8. We gave it the reach property, so it goes back down to a D6. And it's a martial weapon, so it goes up to a D8. So yeah, it is kind of a worse version of the halberd or a glaive. I think we found a worse weapon than the nunchucks! But it doesn't have the heavy property, which opens it up for more characters to use. And it fits into that logic of the system we just described. So even if it's not perfect, it lets us know we're on the right track. So another weapon that could exist but doesn't would be a martial weapon that has the two-handed reach and finesse properties. 
What could that be? Well, if it does bludgeoning damage, it could be a meteor hammer. You know, a long ball and chain. Very cool weapon, I would love to use that. Or with slashing damage, it could be a Naginata. I think I'm thinking of the Ko-Naginata, but maybe someone with more expertise can let me know. Or if it did piercing damage, it could be our spiked chain. It is essentially a whip that you use with two hands and in exchange you get a little boost in damage. And given that the rogue, the character we are most concerned with having a reach finesse weapon, is getting most of their damage from sneak attack, I don't think we really need to worry about that extra one point of damage per hit. How about a martial weapon that is thrown and versatile? Uh, you can imagine it's like a throwing hammer. That could be pretty cool. However, rules as written, adding that throne property makes this strictly better than the Warhammer that's in the book. So we're gonna have to degrade that damage die. So now you have a D6 weapon that can be thrown or it's versatile for a D8. So it's better than a light axe in that you can use it with two hands. It has some situational uses and I think it would make a really cool or unique treasure. How about a simple two-handed weapon with reach? Well, I think that would be a bill. It can be a simple weapon because it's something that a peasant would use to knock down fruit off a tree or trim branches. So it makes sense that everyday people could get some combat use out of that with minimal training. Since I'm on a roll, let's try another one. How about simple, finesse, and versatile? That's sort of a weird one. What sort of weapon do you have to be, have pinpoint accuracy that gets better if you use two hands? Well, maybe a stiletto, which is essentially a big spike used to pierce through layers of armor or weak points at the joint. I think we can justify how even though the weapon is mostly focused on accuracy, using two hands would deal more damage. And I admit, we're kind of stretching this out now, but I think I gave you a good base to go ahead and create your own weapons using these rules. Finding missing armor is a bit more tricky because the table is pretty well filled out as it is. Armor only has a few classifications we can mess with. Base armor class, how much dexterity you can add, strength requirement, proficiency, weight, cost, and disadvantage with stealth. But only a few of those ultimately affect the balance of the piece. And of those that do, the max armor class, the disadvantage with stealth, the proficiency, and the strength requirement, the table is already pretty well filled out. So in that realm, with the possible exception of one thing, there just aren't that many holes to plug in the system. But there are still popular fantasy tropes that aren't incorporated in 5e, so we're going to have to use those other non-balanced properties in order to get them in. Dragonhide can be a breastplate that weighs less but costs more. Or we can do a mithril shirt that's just plate mail that costs 10 times as much more and only weighs 5 pounds. And, and here's where it's going to get a little bit tricky. I think we can eliminate the strength requirement too. I can see that one being a bit more contentious. And obviously there's no buckler. There is no shield that only adds one to your AC. I think someone would have to homebrew a special property to go along with that in order to really make it click with the system. Like maybe it doesn't require proficiency. There are some weapons that are already in the book that break the rules that I just showed you. The trident is the worst version of the spear, the hand axe is busted, and the rapier is the best weapon on the table. I can give you some insight into why those weapons are the way they are, and I wish I could share the source with you, but that video got taken down for reasons. The light axe is the way it is because they wanted to give martial characters something that they could throw with their strength that would be better than if they took a dex-based option. And literally the only reason they have a trident in the game is because they have characters that have artwork using tridents. That's it. The rapier is an odd case because it's definitely an overpowered weapon that sort of breaks the fiction. Now, dex based fighters are a lot more viable than longsword fighters when using a shield. But at the same time, the rogues needed something to feel like they kept up with damage, being as they're their only martial class without extra attack. And following our system, the rapier would end up as a D6 weapon with a versatile property. And I think you can imagine this as instead of actually using the weapon with two hands, they have their offhand free. Yeah, that's it. That's the video, folks. I did this one all in just a few takes, and I hope you liked it. Hopefully, it's going to take me a lot less time to edit and produce this video. And if you like this style, it means I'll be able to put out more of them with a lot less effort. So be sure to let me know. If you like my thoughts on game design, I have a $1 Patreon where I have probably a dozen streams on making classes and weapons, all sorts of cool stuff. And I also have a book that has a whole new system for martial options and all the proceeds go to the Cancer Research Institute. Check it out, link below. As always, if you found this video useful, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and if you have any thoughts on weapons that you came up with, be sure to let me know in the comments below. Mm -hmm.